So hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're so appreciative you took time out of your busy schedule to join this information session and consultation for the new Dawes Road Library and Community Hub. My name is Pam Saliba and I'm an area manager at TPL looking after 16 branches across the city including the lovely Dawes Road branch. I'll be your MC for this evening. Post captioning has been made available and should be visible on your screen. If you're having any issues with that, please let us know in the chat. But oh, next slide, please. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that Toronto Public Library is situated on Indigenous land and Dish with One Spoon territory. This is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations. Toronto Public Library gratefully acknowledges these Indigenous nations for their guardianship of this land. Next slide. So welcome, oh, back one slide, please, Michael. So welcome again to all, and now I'll introduce a few individuals in attendance tonight. First off, we do have Councillor Brad Bradford for Ward 19, Beaches East York, joining us. And you'll get to hear from him from just in just a minute. We also have in attendance a couple of members of our Toronto Public Library Board, including our TPL Board Chair, Sue Graham Nutter, and TPL Board Member and Councillor for Ward 24, Paul Ainsley. Welcome to the both of you, and thank you for joining us. From TPL, we have several dedicated staff with us tonight. So first, we've got Mo Hosseiniara, Director of Branch Operations and Customer Experience. We'll be sharing a bit of background on the project in just a bit. We also have Craig Todd Langell and Eileen Sidmore from the Dawes Road Branch, as well as, as Susan Martin, Gail Rankin, Nancy Lee, and Paula smith Naden from our Capital Projects team. We also have from City of Toronto staff, from the Social Development, Finance, and Administration Department, John Smith, Edna Ali, and Edna Ali. And from our architectural team, we have our co-presenters, so Andrew Frontini and Michael Bois from Perkins and Will, as well as Aladia Smoke and Jennifer Kinneman from Smoke Architecture. And we would also be remiss not to recognize and thank former Councillor Janet Davis for joining us this evening and for all her tremendous legacy advancing this, this very important project for the Dawes Road community. The next slide, please. So to kick the evening off, I'd like to first invite Councillor Brad Bradford to say a few words. Councillor, the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much, Pam. Um, hey, everyone, great to be here tonight. We've got a good turnout for what's gonna be a really exciting conversation. And, uh, you know, a bit of a kind of pulling the curtain back on some of the things and the work that the staff team have been uh, undertaking over the past number of months. Um, huge thanks to the Toronto Public Library uh, and all of the staff who have really, um, you know, been pulling out all the stops to go to the wall on this project. Uh, this will be transformative for our community. This will be iconic, but this will be a, a, a real gift to the City of Toronto and, and uh, appreciate that we've got both Sue and my, my colleague, Councillor Ainsley on the, on the line tonight. Um, Libraries very much are the heart of our community and the role of a library as a central gathering place um, has always been core to the identity of our neighborhoods. That role has changed and evolved over time as we've changed and evolved as a city. But if you look across Toronto over the past number of years, some of the most magnificent spaces, some of the biggest gifts to our community have in fact been these new capital projects uh, in Toronto Public Libraries, and they stand as, um, you know, really the icons of the best of community, where we come together to expand knowledge, where we come together to share, where we come together as communities and exchange thoughts and ideas. Um, they've always been about that, but I think in the world where we are today, uh, that has never been more important. And what we are bringing to Dawes Road uh, will truly transform the neighborhood uh, in the most spectacular way. So super excited. We'll get to that. Um, for anyone I haven't met yet, my name's Brad Bradford. I may be your city councillor if, if you live uh, west uh, if west of Victoria Park and east of Coxwell, uh, then that's that's me, you're stuck with me. Uh, and, and again, it is really great to have uh, Councillor Ainsley, who's a little bit further east out in Scarborough uh, with us tonight. And of course, my friend, 
and, and everybody's favorite, former Councilor Janet Davis, uh, who was certainly a driving force uh, in bringing this work to where it is today from her time in council. Um, anyone who's on the line for the, the first time, all of those things that I was saying about Dawes Road Library, uh, this has been a long journey. Uh, it's it's not something that that started when I took office in 2018. In fact, it's reflective of many, many years of work and conversations uh, to get to this moment. And tonight's particularly exciting because we have our architectural team here to present the latest and greatest designs and layouts uh, for the new library. Uh, that is Perkins and Will and Smoke Architecture, um, you know, really giants in this field of design and architecture that have come up with something truly spectacular here. Uh, I don't want to overhype it. The, the visuals are going to speak for themselves. So, uh, you know, maybe with that, I'll just kind of stop with the spoilers and, and let you see that, but this will restore um, and have, have a real conscientious effort uh, to uh, restore the indigenous presence uh, here in Taylor Creek. And, uh, you know, I think probably one of the most exciting things about all of this, of course, is it will not just be a library. This will be a hub uh, where we can offer other city programs and services to support our community, especially youth uh, in, in this part of East York. So uh, with that in mind, I want to say thanks to the staff at SDFA, that's Social Development and Finance and Administration. Um, I know that the SDFA staff are on the line tonight to ask uh, to answer any questions that folks might have on that front. Uh, about the hub and how we're leveraging this city land and those investments um, to deliver something really impactful here for the community. So with that, I am going to flip it back over to you, Pam, with a note of thanks and gratitude for everyone on the line tonight and I'm looking forward to the presentation. Thank you so much, Councillor Bradford, for your kind words of welcome and for all the support and all the championing you've done for this project. It's very much appreciated by the community, I'm sure. So now I'll jump into the agenda for the evening. We're going to start with some project background with Mo from TPL, as well as an overview of the community hub opportunities that we have here with John from SDFA from the city's social development, finance and administration department. Afterwards, I'll share a bit of information on consultations to date, and we'll jump into a presentation from our architects on the new building design. So that's the, the meat of the presentation. And Gail Rankin, who works with our capital projects team here at TPL, will then go over a few next steps with us. And afterwards, we have a good chunk of time to take your questions and any suggestions or ideas that you'd like us to share. So next slide, please. So now on to Mo, who's going to share a bit of background information on this really exciting project. Thank you, Pam, and uh, thank you, Councillor Bradford, for uh, those uh, opening comments. Um, he stole a lot of my content, which is excellent, which means my part will be shorter. We can get right to the best part, which is the presentation, but just a little bit of um, brief background. Um, what we're doing here is replacing the existing Dawes Road Library. That's about 6,500 square feet. Um, what we're giving back to the community is a 20,000 square foot branch, um, which is going to be spectacular, as uh, Councillor Bradford has mentioned. Um, the project is 5,500 square foot community hub, which uh, John Smith um, and the team from Social Development and Finance Administration will be talking um, about uh, later in the presentation um, and all the good stuff that that brings. And again, that's uh, thanks to, um, you know, I'm going to throw another shout out to former Councillor Janet Davis as well, because um, she was um, instrumental in moving this along. And as Councillor Bradford mentioned, this has been a project in the works for many, many, many years. Um, I've just been working on it for the past six years. Um, it goes back to about 2007 and actually prior to that. So we're really thrilled that we can um, turn around and give this um, beautiful new facility um, to the community, uh, much deserved, and uh, looking forward to you know opening the doors um, at some point and allowing everybody to come in. The other thing of note, um, you know, as Councilor Bradford mentioned, um, we take pride both in the services we offer, but also the facilities that we turn um, over to the community. Um, this particular branch is actually identified as one of um, the mayor's uh, urban design initiative um, projects. So um, high expectations, and I can tell you right now, um, the, the architects are not disappointing with what they've um, designed for this community. And so we're really looking forward um, to, again, sharing all this with you. Um, there's also some um, fabulous uh, environmental um, initiatives that are coming out of this. We have 
um, uh, hoping to achieve and um, working towards um, net zero energy, net zero carbon um, on this project. So um, we're in the process of continuing to do the feasibility studies um, just to see what's possible on the site. So um, looking forward to um, making that happen. And again, as um, Councillor Bradford mentioned, um, you know, the library plays an important role. Um, we've actually, um, based on the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, truth and reconciliation report. We've uh, developed our own report, and we feel that you know we have an important um, process to play in reconciliation. And one of our um, initiatives is to um, provide culturally safe and relevant spaces, um, and we do that through our capital projects. And this will be the first branch um, that has uh, incorporated Indigenous design. And again, you'll see and hear from our Indigenous architects here on this project as well. Um, Smoke Architect, um, they've done a fabulous job, um, and there's been extensive community consultation. Again, you'll hear about that in, um, in the uh, slides uh, that are coming forward. Um, with that, I think I'm going to stop because the uh, star of this presentation is the actual um, uh, uh, building itself and the architects um, going to be uh, uh, bringing that uh, forward shortly. So back over to you, Pam, and welcome everyone. That's great. Thanks so much, Mo, for the really helpful background information. It is definitely a project years in the making. So now we'll move on to John Smith from the City of Toronto, who's going to share some information on Community Hub. John Smith, over to you. Uh, thanks, Pam. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be working with uh, the Toronto Public Library. Uh, library is great partners and uh, I believe the Dawes Road Hub uh, is going to be a fantastic space. Um, it, and and I, I, I've learned so much in this process and uh, so much from uh, the community feedback that have come through so, thus far uh, in the consultation pro process. And um, hoping to add more and more as we walk through uh, this process, uh, all the way through to the build and to the opening of the library and the hub. Um, I think it's a very exciting uh, process because uh, it is talking about bringing community together. I have a one slide that sort of captures uh, a lot of the main ideas uh, that we've been hearing through consultations. Um, and, and I think some of the things have been said that uh, I just want to reinforce. It is about creating a space uh, and, and, and increasing the access to space and community, uh, especially in the Dawes Road area. Um, our work in social development uh, often involves partnerships, involves investing in the well-being of neighborhoods in inclusive neighborhoods. And um, but we need spaces and space access is often one of the most important assets uh, that community residents, community groups and organizations uh, and, and uh, are asking for. And in this, in, in the Dawes Road uh, story of the library and soon to be community hub, I think it's a, uh, it, it's a great story about community coming together, working with their local counselor and, uh, and, 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 and getting the investments that are necessary to make a fantastic future space for the community. Um, in SDFA, we support active partnerships and it's great that this is not only a partnership between uh, Social Development Finance Administration and uh, Toronto Public Library, but with the hub, it's gonna be a partnership with the community. And we're looking to invest in a space that actually encourages that partnership in a number of different ways. Um, and, and, and we wanna ensure that all residents, especially residents who haven't had access to space and resident groups and organizations that are looking for space uh, can actually access uh, the hub. Um, and, and with that, create a variety of programs and services that are re a reflection of the needs of the community and a reflection of the aspirations of the community. And that includes training opportunities because we're well aware of the changing environments uh, uh, in the city. Uh, we're aware of you know, the work that's gone in right now just to support uh, residents, especially the more vulnerable residents. And that involves opportunities for skill development and training uh, for grassroots groups, for young people, for older adults, and for anyone that's, that's looking for those opportunities. And uh, we're hoping to put, uh, you know, um, create a space that is a part of a welcoming community for newcomers as well. So um, I can't say enough about the, the response that we've gotten from the community. 
uh, except that um, there's more opportunity all the way through for community participation. And we want to build it not only through the consultation process, but we want to help sh uh, shape eventually what will be a service plan for the hub uh, and a plan that is a plan of growth, a living plan, and involves uh, a, you know, a, a community participation all the way through. So um, I, I like Mo, I, I don't want to take up too much time. I want to uh, uh, allow for like the, the big reveal uh, in terms of uh, what's coming forward. So uh, back to you, Pam. That's great. Thank you so much, John. Very helpful. And you're totally right. Consultation has been essential to this whole present to this whole project and the process. So I'm actually going to be uh, reviewing a little bit more information about consultation just to add to what you've already shared. So here's a chart providing a bit of an overview of some of the consultations to date. A feedback for this whole project has been received directly through two virtual public consultations an online survey, as well as paper surveys made available to customers at the library branch. In addition, we've had uh, dedicated consultations held for the Indigenous communities, as well as the local community agencies and grassroots organizations. So soon, Aladia Smoke from Smoke Architecture will share a little bit more about our Indigenous consultations in the next section of our presentation. But in the meantime, I can review at a high level a few items that have come through consultations that we're very um, eager to deliver and excited that we're able to include in our plan. So that would be the next slide, please, Michael. Perfect. So <clears throat> this is a very quick overview of what we've heard throughout some of the consultations that John mentioned previously and, and the ones that were on the slide uh, just before. So we're happy to report that we can achieve a space that meets these community needs and includes more space, including space to attend public meetings of programs, as well as dedicated space for youth, and a teaching kitchen as well was something that was identified through our community hub consultation, as well as more public computers, collections, study tables, and better Wi-Fi is something we heard quite a bit. Improved accessibility overall inside and outside of the building, including improvements along city sidewalks, were also uh, aspects that we heard through the consultation that we're able to deliver on through this project, as well as better acoustic control throughout the library and hub to help meet these various community needs as many different activities will be taking place simultaneously throughout the building. So that's just at a very high level, some of, the, some of what we've heard in the consultation that we're very eager to deliver on. And as both John and Mo have said, we are really here to hear from the architects. So we're gonna move on to their portion of the presentation. So the next slide, please. And I'll hand things off to Michael and and from Perkins and Will, as well as Aladia and Jennifer from Smoke Architecture to take to take you through some really incredible concepts and rendering. Take it away. Thanks so much, Pam. I'll um, I'll try and MC our four person team and we'll jump in and out as as need be. So just starting off with this beautiful view from from Taylor Creek, uh, looking back to the community and some of the some of the high rise residential components. So. You know, here, I think we, we all know where Dawes, Dawes, uh, Dawes Road Library is, just kind of places it in the greater geographical context and seeing seeing that network of ravines, which actually was so important to Canada's uh, Indigenous peoples, it were, those were their highways. When we zoom in, we kind of see that we're part of four neighbourhoods coming together, Taylor Massey, Taylor Creek Park, Oak Ridge and O'Connor Parkview, the library serving those four areas. We did presented this slide when we were actually pitching to win the job, and we just talked about how important the library is in its context and the kind of areas and spaces and green trails and the and the ravine and the things that you can actually walk to from the library within a five minute or ten minute walk, which is the outer circle. And that the library itself is kind of part of a set of spaces that that kind of can, if we design the library properly, can, can begin to start to connect together. Um, we have this, the, the park, uh, George Webster Park. We have the school, which is the pink kind of L-shaped piece, Dawes Road Library. It's kind of in the center of these things. And there's also uh, Joshua uh, Concrete uh, Parkette. And then we, we, we connect back in De, through Denora Park into Taylor Creek uh, uh, Ravine. So it's a kind of, at a sort of nexus where some of these spaces can start to link up if we provide the public amenities to kind of make that connection and create a good pedestrian uh, environment. 
And, and these are sort of some views that just kind of capture really how eclectic and varied the context is, you know, ranging from large multi-use residential to, uh, to small single family homes and apartments. And then of course, um, you know, there's the, um, the, the, the Taylor Creek itself and, 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 the, and the kind of high rise nodes of, it, of residential that we have. And these are kind of from the 60s and 70s and they're actually important kind of density boosters and a lot of new Canadians uh, stay or come to neighborhoods with this kind of housing because it's accessible, affordable, and, and allows them to kind of uh, begin their journey as Canadians. We also learned that as we, we kind of looked at the demographics, that this is a community of learners. We have a population change where we're seeing you know, we're seeing new people coming to the neighborhood. We're also seeing an increase in the number of children. And so, uh, and the kind of family size starting to grow. So it's, it speaks to um, people who are, are interested in learning and, and kind of uh, developing in the library is really important for that. We have a kind of higher instance of immigration in this area. So we kind of took all of these thoughts and, and, we, and we, we tested them against the guiding principles, which TPL had developed. And I'll just read the, the bold text, which is to strengthen and expand valuable community resource, uh, to be an exemplar for TPL's indigenous initiatives on the first new construction project that's, that's going to be celebrating this. And that's very important. We're honored to be part of that, to create a sense of place and to strive for the highest standards of sustainability that are feasible. And Mo spoke of a net zero carbon and net zero energy analysis that we've been conducting, as well as integrating Toronto's green standards, which are very stringent. So this is going to be um, a very sustainable building in any case, and we're just we're just really testing right now in schematic design how far we can take that. And then we want to create something that's ultimately constructible, functional, and brings good value to taxpayers and library users. The City of Toronto's planning department did some initial massing studies on the site, and these are these are kind of two two views. Uh, one sort of from the from the south and uh, and then one more from the east and, and they give you a sense of what the city was looking for the image on the right shows a plaza of 210 square meters framed by the library and that's important They're an acknowledgement that they want to see a public realm node there and then the image on the left really shows you know a three-story configuration but with setbacks that step down to acknowledge the change in height that we have with uh, our neighboring properties single family homes so those are both considerations that we've tried to take into account. Now, that's the setup. I'll dive into the, you know, it's all about suspense here. Uh, we'll dive into the design concept. Um, we started off together, um, Smoke and, and, and Perkins and Will, to think about um, what a library would be in this context and what a library with a strong Indigenous cultural component would be. And, we thought of the library as, as a journey, and I'll pass it to Lady to speak about the second idea. Wow. Oh, was... yeah. Well, the idea that, that culture is a verb, and these both speak to an active use of the library and cultural traditions within Indigenous culture, if I'm not mistaken, that talk about learning by doing, learning by making, and learning by being as opposed to just uh, a very important on reading, which we have in. Uh, in yeah, the culture is a process that, that we undertake together and uh, that uh, it's an active process. So culture isn't just a thing that you write down and then read about later. It's it's a thing that you continue to do together through activity and and it's a constantly changing and growing act, um, you know, process of being. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, we acknowledge that by um, using Star Blanket as a jumping off point for the design inspiration. So uh, there's uh, several meanings and teachings behind that Star Blanket. Through speaking with Indigenous community members, we heard a few news stories that we hadn't heard yet, including that uh, that star pattern represents um, uh, memory of our ancestors and all of the gifts of knowledge that they've given us. Uh, so when you're wrapping somebody with a star blanket, you're representing the fact that their community honors the work that they're doing 
Um, it's a real honor to be able to create that blanket for someone, and it's a real honor to receive it. And the, the inference is that you're wrapping them in the attention and, uh, and support of our ancestors. Uh, so this, this idea of the star blanket as recognizing the really good community work that will occur inside of the libraries is um, really core to how we undertook the design inspiration. It also has a symbolism of bringing together disparate elements. So in some wedding ceremony, you'd see uh, the, the couple wrapped together in, in a blanket representing that they're undertaking the rest of their life's journey together, uh, similar to Toronto Public Library and SDFA, or perhaps members of different cultures coming together and sharing knowledge. Next slide. Uh, so we took this dynamism of a blanket. You can think of how a blanket moves when you're when you're walking, when you're dancing. The sense of shelter that that it gives, the sense of warmth and safety that it provides, uh, and and you can sort of extrapolate that into how architecture might create a welcoming and uh, comforting environment. Next slide. This is another uh, inspiration that we took, uh, the idea of platforms. So the Haudenosaunee Longhouse has platforms that flank a central activity space. Those platforms were used for a variety of types of things, including storage, uh, for instance, of books, and uh, sleeping. Um, uh, well, the central activity space was sort of a zone of, of, of shared activity. Next slide. The circle uh, is also tremendously important, particularly to Anishinaabek peoples. Uh, so those two regional nations make up the, you know, two very significant Indigenous uh, na national groups in our territory. So Anishinaabek understand the cyclical rhythms of life as represented by a circle, and this represents several uh, teachings that revolve around this that that are diagrammed through this shape so the concept of manoba madzawin or the good life um, living life in a good way according to the seven sacred teachings that are our um, grandparent teachings uh, the idea that life begins in the east with the rising of the sun and it cycles around as the sun does uh, to um, you know that place of elder which is in the north so these are just some examples of the types of teachings that that circle represents next slide so in architectural space this can almost diagram diagrammatically represent some of those teachings that we receive from our ancestors where uh, for example the roundhouse embodies an interconnectedness of all systems of life in the shapes that you see in the space so the space itself is used for knowledge sharing but it also creates its own teaching elements so as you're teaching in that space you can you're you're diagrammatically representing all of the teachings that you're sharing by the space itself so that's what we were shooting for in this design next slide uh, so celebrating outdoor spaces is really critical. Now, in a tight urban space like this, we have a few options for um, really wonderful connection to land, but we make full use of those uh, limited options. And uh, we think that, you know, land-based teachings just require connection to, to land and natural areas, vegetation, in order to really accomplish knowledge sharing. Next slide. So, so this brings we, us to yeah, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, sorry, lady. It's tough. There's a bit of delay, so sometimes I excuse me if I step on your microphone. Yeah. So those, I think the lady's done a wonderful job of bringing the kind of inspirational ingredients of the design together. And this is kind of these mappings kind of talk about how they come together. Um, we sort of started at the ground, and we were really um, wanting to to bring all these ideas together in something that would actually connect the city to the library and, and the hub space and then up to that roof space that a lady was a lady was talking about where we where we can have a garden again that can actually overlook the neighborhood and visually tie us back to the ravine so we start with a kind of front porch a nice open setback which creates a sort of plaza 
um, that's partially sheltered, which is the front door to the building, but which faces onto Dawes Road. And this diagram just talks about when it will get sun and how it will be protected, shaded as required. Let's go to the next slide. Then the platforms where Lady was referencing that Haudenosaunee longhouse, this is kind of our interpretation of that. It's a library on multiple levels. And of course, there are multiple uses on those platforms. And the idea is to be able to connect visually back to the ground, back to that front porch plaza and back to the city. And you've seen the idea of the roof and, 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 and the, the round element, the roundhouse is going to be interpreted as a special meeting space that has access both to the library and to this roof garden we're going to propose. And we'll talk a bit more about that. Maybe I'll, Lady, if you want to speak to this line and, and, and the ingredients of that roundhouse. Sure. Um, uh, the roundhouse has several sim symbolic um, significances. So uh, the, uh, the fact that you meet in a circle means that everyone coming and sitting in that circle has an equal contribution to make and an equal uh, responsibility to make good, con good contributions to the, the conversation that's happening. Roundhouse is a pre-contact architectural form uh, that's been used uh, since time immemorial uh, in international nations for um, activities that have a significance to the community as a whole. Uh, in the, it represents a connection to the seven directions where we have the east doorway representing that new beginnings, the west doorway representing, um, you know, youth and vigor, uh, the, um, the south door, sorry, that was the south doorway, the west doorway sort of adulthood taking responsibility for each other. The north doorway, that transmission of knowledge or wisdom, and that's the elders doorway. And then the direction of up represents our connection to sky, down representing our connection to Shkagamakwe or earth. And then that center is the direction of self or balance. So overall, the the form of the roundhouse is really important to be able to understand uh, an indigenous worldview. And it's also very critical to be able to follow indigenous protocols of knowledge sharing. So it's a really uh, critical space. And what we heard in uh, from indigenous people in the neighborhood is that this needs to be in the center. It needs to occupy the heart of the building. So that's where we placed it. So the other ingredient, of course, which is connected to the roundhouse is the is the city garden where we hope to have a range of plantings. We'll show you some 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 landscape concepts in a bit. But the idea that there will be edible plants, medicinal plants, spaces for gathering, and a direct connection to the hub. And this is kind of an example of another roof garden, kind of how we imagine it. Lots of green, lots of shelter, lots of opportunity for gathering. So the blanket itself. Um, is going to wrap the building, in it. and as Lady said, it's really a celebration of this partnership between between the hub and the library, and and the and the blanket will kind of metaphorically and physically enfold them, and then protect everyone inside. It's going to be a high high efficiency envelope that provides that thermal performance, which is part of our our sustainability target. And this slide shows some precedents of how we are exploring or might want to achieve the idea of a blanket, which of course is is not made of fabrics that an architectural um, cladding. So here are some examples of different kinds of metal shingles and tiles which incorporate color and different textures so that we can begin to communicate the kind of patterns and geometric composition that you see in the star blanket precedent that the lady was referencing earlier. So all of these things come together on the top of the city garden, blanket, a structural frame, the roundhouse nestled in the heart of the building, the activity platforms, and that urban plaza, that front porch, which addresses the city. So this is kind of like, you know, an Ikea. It's an Ikea assembly diagram. We pulled everything apart. But now we're going to put it back together and show you what the building actually looks and feels like. But first. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so um, we just want to let you know that we've already, this is one step in uh, an, a really um, thorough and comprehensive consultation process that TPL is dedicated to undertake. 
regarding this library. Uh, so we started with um, figuring out the right tools uh, to speak with people. Um, and given uh, you know pandemic times, we did a lot of this remotely. However, we had um, some pretty effective tools that we that we formulated actually using uh, local uh, Indigenous input um, early on in the process. Then we supported TPL in uh, performing those engagement sessions, which we did with a number of significant uh, active in their community entities and, and individuals uh, representing uh, Toronto um, and surrounding area Indigenous peoples. Uh, so now we're in a process of uh, summarizing design directives, which have really driven the core design decisions that we've taken. Uh, and we've reported that back uh, in a process of, um, of uh, letting the community know where we've taken these ideas. So these are just an example. Uh, so where we are now is to um, make sure that this uh, informed design response we've formulated is appropriately responding to what we heard. Uh, so these are some of the entities that we liaised with. Um, uh, and it was such a honor to speak with all of these folks because they're um, we always learn something new <laughs> when we talk with uh, with community members. So it was a real treat to speak with all of these people. Uh, this is some quotations that we heard um, just that the liveliness uh, of the design should reflect uh, a connection. Uh, to Mother Earth and that, uh, you know, some of that flowing dynamism would be a, a, a welcome addition to the urban fabric, uh, that it, it represents a feeling of togetherness and uh, it, it also represents the love that, that passes between people who are sharing, sharing knowledge and have that love of learning. So the next step was really how do we how do we take this incredible idea and translate it into a building, something we can build? And so as soon as we could sort of get together uh, in physical space, um, are the teams from, from Smoke and Perkins and Will, we got together in our Toronto studio. And thanks for coming all the way from, from Hamilton, Lady and Jennifer. And we started to sort of um, get pretty experimental. Um, I, it, it, you know, again, limited access to space and workshops. I built a kind of maquette in my backyard, which is a one to 25 scale of the building. We got some industrial felt and we just began to explore together how a blanket might look when it's wrapped around something like the library. So, um, and we did a number of different options, photographing them and experimenting and hmm, that looks right or that doesn't. And the next thing we did was take a LIDAR, which is laser 3D scanning technology, uh, available actually on your phone as an app. You can scan an object, you walk around it, and you get a three-dimensional computer model of that. And from that, this isn't actually the option we use, but you can see you can see the frame and the felt blanket and various experiments, and we managed to create a computer model of that. Um, and the next step was to try and turn that into um, into to a gesture that would accommodate the building. So, so we arrived at really something that was about the blanket wrapping around. That was the kind of gesture we chose. We looked at how we would put windows in it. Um, next slide. And um, and then Jennifer and Aladia really got deep into the pattern. And I'll pass it over to you. To talk about that exploration. Thank you. Um, so, uh, for one, that star um, blanket is is composed very carefully of uh, parallelograms, uh, and it has a very defined axis to it. It has this directionality that spreads from the center, and um, a sort of a, a um, well, the colors are diverse. There's sort of an overall logic where there's a background color, a primary color, and then several secondary colors. Next slide. 
so you can see those elements represented and how we've um, placed the star patterning on, on the building. Uh, so you can see that the central axis is located at the deepest portion of the facade and that those parallelogram shapes define the window openings, uh, the color blocks that you see there, that directionality sort of explodes outward in a really dynamic way. And, um, and we have sort of that idea of a, of a background color, a primary and some secondary colors. And the way we're thinking about achieving these now are through a zinc, um, zinc metal panel, which is a kind of a, it's kind of a shingle and, and zinc can be patinated with various chemicals to achieve <clears throat> this range of colors. We have a natural kind of pale gray, a darker blue gray, and then a kind of what you see is a kind of ready red oxide sort of color. So those provide those background primary and secondary colors that that a lady referenced and this is the south facing elevation and this is what the building looks like from the east so that's the main entry and that's where the blanket sort of wraps around or maybe it's opening up to invite the community in and you can see into the to sort of three-story atrium space and in the background even see the roundhouse and we'll have some views that make that a bit clearer in a minute this is the north side, which people aren't going to see too much of because it's up against an existing apartment building. What you do see that's interesting in this view is that this or the existing uh, Dawes Road library and the condominium structure on top of it actually have a parking garage and the land falls away to the northwest. And so we're making use of that to create a daylit basement, which has some staff space for TPL in it. And then the west elevation space is back to the and you can see quite clearly the roundhouse here on, on the roof uh, now. This is a complex drawing for many people, a section. It's sort of based, the idea if you slice a, if you slice a slice of bread, you can see all the air bubbles and everything inside. And that's, that's what we're showing here. This is a kind of cut that through that shows the three floors. It shows the blanket as kind of skin around the building, structural frame, which supports everything. And then the roundhouse kind of floating in space um, up on the third level. The net zero carbon study is, is a complex piece uh, of analysis. I'll really describe in very summary terms what we're doing when we when we look at that. We take a baseline building, which is, is provided uh, in the National Energy Code and um, it represents what a library might use in terms of energy, a normal library. And the first thing we do is say, okay, well, how can we begin to lower the energy consumption through passive design? And passive design really means things that happen without, you know, machines and systems. It happens through great windows, lots of insulation, potentially natural ventilation, how the building is oriented on the site. Are we protected from cold? prevailing winds, are we shading the building through overhangs? All of these things can, can be used to lower the heating and cooling loads. Then the next big move, especially when we're talking about net zero carbon, and to define that term, carbon that's released into the atmosphere as a result of energy that we produce and use and things that we make. So we're trying to stop doing that. And a great way to, to start that with that is, and you can see the big step that goes happens is because we switch from from gas fired or fossil fuel fired um, machinery, heating and cooling equipment, and we switch to electric. And because in Ontario we have a significant portion of our uh, electrical distribution grid that is actually um, fueled by by non carbon producing sources, i.e., nuclear, wind, solar, and hydroelectric we're able to get that carbon footprint down by just going electric. And, you know, we then look at operations, controls, and monitoring. And you all know you have thermostats at home. How smart is that thermostat? Is it just heating the thing all day or does it lower the thermostat when you go off to work? So by using kind of digital, digitally controlled and coordinated systems and by actually measuring the space and how we're using it, we can begin to bring that, that load down even further and then we start to look at the potential for renewable energy. How much room do we have for, in this case, we're going to be looking at photovoltaic solar panels on the roof. And if there's still a carbon um, footprint left, we can purchase carbon offsets. And that's really where you are 
um, buying an offset from, you're in a way sponsoring renewable carbon-free uh, energy uh, modes. And so you're investing in the future when you do that. So it's not a bad thing or a cop-out. It's actually a way to contribute to the transformation of our society towards a net zero carbon future. So those are the steps we've been looking at and um, costing and analyzing payback over, over many years. And it's looking really positive. So that's the journey we're on right now. Now we're gonna look at the floor plans and some three-dimensional views. Um, here's the site plan, Dawes Road and Chapman Avenue, and we're just locating the building. You can see the dotted line represents the site that, that, that we own or the TPL owns. And then there's a city a boulevard or sidewalk around it. And it's actually quite a substantial amount of, of area. And what we wanna do is work with the city and work with the, the, the planning and public realm and urban design to pretend that line's not there and design it as if it's one public boulevard that goes from the curb where the road is right to the building and we can treat it as one landscape space. We have more area, we can make it seamless, we can make it feel more civic um, and we can introduce more greenery. That's really a big goal once we get a bit more. And I have to say all of these are at the schematic design level so they're quite early but we're starting to get a good sense. This is the lower level, not much interest. It's not a public space, but there is staff space down there and there is storage both for uh, SFDA and for the library. And, that's, and then there's kind of mechanical electric. This is the first floor and you can see um, number 15 is that public plaza or front porch we were talking about. We're looking about some soft spaces, rain garden to collect storm water. We have to deal with all of our storm water on, on the site. We're not allowed to splush it down the drain and send it to the lake. So every drop of rain that falls and falls off the roof has to be dealt with and directed into the ground water table again on this site. So we have to look at soft scape, permeable paving, a, a, a green roofs, cisterns where we trap water and use it again um, for irrigation or waste conveyance. So all of those things to be borne in mind. Um, when you look at the plan 15, that plaza, there's a black arrow and that points to zero one. That's the entry into the library, the vestibule. You come into that vestibule and you have the choice to go upstairs to the hub directly, either through the stair or through an elevator. And that can be controlled off hours if we don't want people going there. Or you can take a left turn past the main reception desk and go into the library. Um, within the library proper, 04 is what we're calling the performance space. And in many uh, TPL branches, there's something called an urban living room. It's kind of a combination of, it's like a living room for the community. And it has the potential to, with the movable furniture, become a space for events. Number five, and, or so number six, sorry, are, are the children's area, which is on the ground floor. It makes sense if people are coming in with strollers, we want access to grade. There's gonna be lots of green space hugging up against the building. So those views are softened at the community. So that whole open green space is a combination of book stacks and seating areas. Um, we have banks of washrooms uh, at number nine, and we have both universal family style washrooms or individual um, washrooms that you, you have your own uh, lab and sink combination. And then 10 in the back is the, um, is the staff space for, so, so for materials handling and circulation. And then at the back on the on the left hand side, you have just access for loading um, and shipping receiving. So a nice open ground floor with lots of glass and clear routes up to either the second floor or the hub space. On the second floor, you can see um, a number of really interesting program elements. First of all, you see the kind of curvy shape. Well, that's the wall, the blanket, kind of wrapping around and opening up towards the east. There's an open to below space, which is in white and has an X through it. And that represents really a three-story space that you overlook down to that performance space. Number, as you, I just maybe you said, Michael, if you highlight where the elevators are. So if you came up the stairs or the elevators, you'd arrive into what is essentially kind of teen area. There'll be books on display. There's a staff point, so staff can help see everyone coming up. And the teen area connects over actually to number 11, which is, is a youth hub. And um, that's just kind of a great clubhouse space where, where kids can come after school, hang out. It's got storage, you know, digital, digital tools, study space. It's just a great, great space, a small kitchenette. Um, the, the kind of 
bluish space is the, the adult collection. And kind of in between all those, number 10, there's a series of three kind of very transparent um, study rooms. Behind that at number five is, is the digital technology space or creative technology center. And we're really looking at that being a combination of analog and digital technologies, everything from 3D printing to sewing can happen in this kind of big flexible open space. And then it connects directly onto a nice big multi-purpose room. And there's a sliding partition there. So those can become kind of one interconnected space. And, and they can function in a number of different ways. You know, you could have the um, technology suite closed off and still access the multi-purpose room or vice versa, or they can become one space. So then we get up to the top level, which is rarely where we where we have our community hub. And, and there's a lot of spaces here, which are kind of related to, to the, the administration of the space. I won't go into too much detail, but what's really great, something that we have up here is a community kitchen, which is number five and, and a community room number six. And those are kind of interconnected and can flow together. So you can imagine you can be having cooking classes, demonstrations, and you can really have a great community event there that, that where those spaces flow together. They also have great connection to the round room, which is number 16. And the round room kind of has is perched over that multi-story atrium with a almost with a bridge link. So you really feel like you're going to, you know, another place. Uh, you enter in through this kind of like, uh, you know, uh, Lady and Jennifer have kind of crafted this really nice, almost like a, it peels apart and there's and the doorways are sort of hidden and you kind of move into the space. Um, and enter into it and it'll be, a, you know, kind of really unique and wonderful uh, environment. You can similarly exit out directly into the garden. And again, the garden is configured with a series of soft spaces for planting of different things. And number 17 represents a sort of central gathering space with the potential for a, a temporary fire pit. And that can be a really wonderful space to fuse out over the neighborhood, out to the west, towards the setting sun. It will be a really unique environment. Another key space up here, number nine, is the training room, training training facility. We also have consultation rooms, counseling rooms, and then we have a boardroom and meeting rooms and, and a kind of support space for the hub. So um, this is a space that will obviously run as its own entity, but library users have access to this to this roof level in order to access the roof garden and the roundhouse. I don't know, lady, if there's anything else you, you wanted to, to add on that. On that plan or um, I think uh, the only thing that I'd add is the roundhouse is sort of uh, prominent in the space. Uh, the reason we put it on the third floor is because it's really related to SDFA's community-based activities, so it really makes a lot of sense on the third level. It um, uh, it opens directly to this outdoor landscaped area that's so essential for uh, knowledge sharing pertaining to land-based learning. Um, urban agriculture could find a home up there. Um, it's a multifunctional space, and you can also see it through that um, that sort of front opening in the blanket from the Civic Plaza that we've developed on the main level. Uh, what that creates on the other levels is uh, a space that can be used for um, uh, reading groups or other uh, uh, sort of group based or even individual enjoyment spaces as the columns connect it back down to earth. Um, the performance space on the main level, I think, is also really important because it's that larger space that opens onto the Civic Plaza, so you can actually have uh, events that fluidly move in, indoors, outdoors. Um, in addition, of course, to the you know the core book stacks and so forth on every level. Um, so I think that was um, speaking to some of the questions that are coming up about sure. the balance between stacks and you know community activity zones. We have, and we've been exploring this three dimensionally a number of different ways, you know, since our crazy felt models, we've started to move into more sophisticated or detailed explorations. And this is a 3D printed and laser cut model. So we can just see how the building's shape looks, how that roof garden's going to feel, how the roundhouse appears in the space and how that main entry is expressed as the blanket comes up together and parts. And this doesn't have any color or representation of the star blanket pattern, but that's coming up in the next slides. But you can certainly see a, see how it's going to sit in this context. And I, and I think we're pretty excited about how, how kind of 
what a dramatic gesture it's going to be and, and what a unique architectural expression be, because of the, the idea of the blanket and, and the kind of fluid, the fluid gesture that we develop to try and communicate that. Uh, just to respond to the the idea of the sacred fire. Um, so uh, sacred fire is really critical for a lot of indigenous knowledge sharing. There's teaching surrounding uh, fire and its role in, in life and society. Um, it's an illustrative metaphorical element that's really, really critical for, for that type of knowledge sharing, which we've heard repeatedly through our indigenous consultations. So regarding the element of safety, um, it, that'll be an operational uh, approach. So fire keepers and indigenous communities are the ones who are responsible for maintaining the safety and undertaking um, building that fire and taking care of it, making sure everyone is quite safe when it's um, when it's burning. Uh, rooftop fire pits uh, do have precedent in the city of Toronto. We're undertaking another one at Centennial College's A building expansion and there, there's at least one other that I know of at the um, uh, children's, um, the CFS uh, rooftop garden has a fire pit as well. So those apprentices, those fire keepers go through a several years long apprenticeship to be able to care for that fire. And that's sort of a, it's an, it's a very honored position that takes a, um, you know, a long uh, apprenticeship to to get there. So the people who are handling that fire won't be sort of like your your average Joe <laughs> coming up here <laughs> feeling like a fire. <laughs> this is a very uh, significant and honorable role that they're uh, that they've trained for for many years to occupy. So <laughs> it's it's not a recreational fire. It's a sacred fire, and uh, City of Toronto is recognizing that that's a need in our communities. Um, so, and, and it'll be uh, very carefully designed to accommodate that. Um, normally this would happen on the ground plane, um, but uh, being as we're in contemporary times with very dense urban zones, I think this is uh, sort of a, a new way of accommodating that function. Okay, well, let's move on to the, we're in the final stretch here, and I know there's quite a few questions, so we're, we're gonna get onto that. Here are some views from the Southeast. Uh, on Dawes Road, and you're again, you can start to see how the, the the star blanket, you know, portrays itself on the south face and on the east face. Those those parallelogram kind of fragments dispersing from that central star. Um, this is a view uh, from from the southwest, and again, you're seeing the south facade and then the the hub space on the roof, and then views from the north. Uh, east on Dawes Road. And then right across the road looking in, and I like this view because you can really see the, the blanket opening up and you can see kind of all of the elements there, there in the background sort of suspended or, or sitting on those four columns is the, is the round room with its own skin opening up to allow you to enter uh, on that bridge element, and that that's that's sitting above that three-story atrium with overlook and balconies. And we're going to actually take you inside a bit to see how that feels. Um, you know, here's a view. If we were up on the second level, on the left are is the kind of a laptop bar and the and the guardrail that protects you as you overlook performance space, and you can see the four pillars that support the round room. We're showing a lot of wood finishes, and actually the the structure of the blanket will be done in a wood uh, panel. You can see we're looking actually towards some of those study rooms and the stacks for the teen area are just on our right. We haven't managed to move the books in yet and these renderings are early days. This is a bit of a, a distorted view, but it gives you a sense of that performance space looking up and seeing the round room um, on the top level and the, the hub space looking down and even views of the sky through the skylight. And then just in a bird's eye view of the whole composition where you see those photovoltaic pa panels that are working towards our net zero carbon, the planted roof, the round room with its kind of gentle, its drape kind of opening up to let you in and out. And, and I think that's a nice counterpoint to the blanket. They're both sort of wrapping and, and folding. And then the blanket itself and the landscape spaces, both on the roof and then tying into the space uh, on the street and that widened boulevard that we want to take advantage of.
So next steps, I don't know if um, Pam, you want to jump in here. I bet you do. Yes, I do. Thank you both so much. That was really wonderful. Just to echo everything in the chat around how lovely the building looks and there's so much enthusiasm and many questions that we're really eager to get to. But just before we get into the question period, I'll throw things over to Gail Rankin. So Gail, if you can, our senior manager for TPL facilities, um, if you could join the call just to share a little bit about next steps at a high level. Yes, thank you, Pam. Thank you, Pam. Um, so the next steps, um, some of them happen in parallel and some of them can only happen one after the other. So we're in the phase of looking at city approvals um, and in parallel, the architects are working on the design development drawings and the construction drawings. Um, after they're complete, there's the city approval process around building permits. Um, and after that phase, we'll move into the pre-qualifications for the general contractor and the tendering of for the selection of the general contractor. Um, once the pricing is received, that goes to our board for approvals. Um, and then the contract is awarded and then we're estimating a construction period of 18 to 24 months. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of variables through this process. Um, we never let the um, dust settle on any of the phases. We're constantly um, negotiating and pushing and following up through each of these steps of the project um, and hoping to have an opening in 2025, the winter of 2025. But of course, that's subject to change based on any roadblocks that we face throughout the next um, three years. Back to you, Pam. Thank you so much, Gail. It's super helpful. Okay, so now we're ready to jump into questions. And I know we've already got quite a few, but if we jump to the next slide, you'll see a few prompts for in case there's, um, here are just a few areas where your feedback would be particularly helpful, but really we wanna hear everything that you have to share. So we've already got some questions. So if it's okay, I'll start to work through them. So uh, first off for either, uh, I think maybe for Andrew, we've got a question around the square footage of the program room. I don't know, perhaps, you or Michael have that information handy, and if not, maybe a comparison space or something uh, might be helpful. Sure, Michael, do you mind going back to the plan? Sure. And, and you probably know the square footage, so. Uh... Yeah, just wanted to clarify which, uh, we're talking about the multi-purpose room on the, on the second. I think so. Second I level. Think so, yeah. One that connects to the creative technology suite, yeah. Sure. Okay, um, I, d I don't know off offhand, but we're looking at about um, a capacity of, of 40 or so people. Um, so around, possibly around five, 500 square feet in that kind of range. Great, thank you so much. So Jan, I hope that answers that question. And then there's also another one on community kitchen. So I'm going to throw this one to John from SDFA. So John, the question is that um, it seems a bit chopped up on the third floor and that there's maybe a community kitchen at George Webster nearby. So wondering if you could share a bit around the thinking for that space. Well, um, I think the, th the, the thinking behind the idea of a, a community kitchen is it was uh, a very popular idea in terms of feedback from the community. Um, the hub overall um, is uh, to be a space where we can have uh, diverse types of activities and food preparation or food training, um, whether it's events for events, uh, whether it's for skill development is, is a high priority. In terms of um, the space, um, the, from, from my knowledge that the kitchen um, there's an opening of the kitchen to uh, from which is number four to the number five area, which allows for some combined space uh, in in terms of having it um, connected uh, to a larger uh, room space. But also the the kitchen um, is is situated in the center, 
uh, as you see, of, of, of the space. In terms of being chopped up, I'm, um, maybe um, there's more uh, information, um, if, if it can be more expanded on, on the idea of it being chopped up. We're going by and, and walking through a process with um, the uh, architects to sort of try to have as fluent space as possible. Great, thank you so much, John. Janet, I don't know if you would like to jump in with further elaboration on the comment as John invited, but it's up to you. Otherwise, we can move on to the next question. I can actually comment, like talk or chat. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you're most welcome to. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yes, I just, wow. I just wondered whether or not the kitchen um, there, there, there always was a big, incredible kitchen in the George Webster School, and it seems to me um, we should be looking not to duplicate any existing assets or resources that exist somewhere else. But um, and secondly, as long as that space can be converted to accommodate um, more than forty people, uh, there has to be a space that can somewhere that can accommodate uh, 100 people. Uh, so many in the community who have cultural events have big cultural events. I know it's not gonna be an event that will have hundreds, but definitely more than 50 uh, somehow, somewhere. Is that possible? Well, I, I, I would say um, that this is the time uh, for that feedback and we thank you for that that, that information because that's something that we need to look at in terms of the design of the space and possibly look at how, you know, maybe it's, and again, I'm not an architect or a designer, but retractable walls to, to, uh, to make things movable so you can have a large space developed out of many spaces. Yeah, like I look at uh, the hub at, at access point mm -hmm. and it yep. has maximum flexibility and can be converted into a very big space as well as smaller spaces. So if we're thinking about that, I guess that's what I think is important about that space because they have up to, you know, 150 people that come to various things uh, as well as small groups of 25. Uh, so that's my comment. <laughs> Thank you. I think we can so definitely look at that, uh, the, you know, how we can combine the, the kitchen, the community room, how can those flow together to be, it's quite a big space if you start to take the partition and think of it a bit differently. So it's really about, you know, day to day, what do they need? Because uh, we take away all the walls, then day to day, the, that that space for forty people or thirty people isn't with the acoustic separation isn't there. So it's kind of a the balancing act. But I think that's great feedback, and we can certainly look at ways to uh, build in that capacity. I think and answer the space there's is there. How we use it, you know. There's space on the main level too. That performance yes. space was envisioned Absolutely. as sort of that expandable zone that yeah. even can incorporate some outdoor civic plaza, you know, overflow. Yeah, on the ground floor to think. I mean, again, you know, I, at many TPL branches, the 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 stacks in these areas are only four shelves high. They're on on wheels, so there's the ability to kind of move them out of the way and. Then you start to have a really big space uh, for the for for larger occasional events on this floor. Obviously, there's a setup time, but but the space can accommodate it. Thank you. I have always thought that the function has to de will decide um, the design, and so yeah. I guess it, John, at some point, I'd love to chat about what the discussions have been about the actual services. Who is committed to being there from the city side and who of the community agencies are interested in space and for what purpose? Thank you very much. The design is stunning. Thank you so much, Janet. Your feedback is so helpful. So we've got a few more questions to get through. I think a quick one I can send. Uh, so Mo, if we could queue you up. I think I've got a couple to send your way. So we'll get Warren, we'll get to your questions. Just a real quick one I think Mo can address. First is about the alternate space and during the closure. 
Absolutely. Um, and I hope you can hear me. I have to switch to my phone. Um, yes, excellent. Good. So, um, yes, uh, as long as we can find the space, um, we will have the operating funds. Typically, the way we do it is the savings from having closed the existing facility. Um, we've got two examples of this. Um, York Woods uh, currently closed and we're um, in York Gate Mall with a, with a temporary pop up space, we call it. Um, and Albert Campbell, which actually isn't too far away from here, um, we've got a pop up space and we're operating it. So our issue, and we've been looking diligently throughout the community to see if we can find an appropriate space. Um, typically what we do is um, look at the strip malls, anything else that, you know, where there's a unit that's available that we can take over for a couple of years. Um, and again, as I say, we've, we've got um, examples of that that um, are currently uh, underway, Yorkwood and Albert Campbell being the two. Great, Mo, thank you so much. I'm sure everyone's glad to hear that we'll have some alternate space during the closure. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, Warren, I think you had a few questions for us. You're our next door neighbor, I believe. So, please feel free to jump on and we're here. Thank now. you, Pam. Um, so, I'm Warren Brown. I am the neighbor directly to the west. I'm at 80 Chapman Avenue. And um, I actually uh, just bought here a couple of years ago and then found out about the library. So, I'm very much aware of the construction. I Congratulations to both design firms and the teams. I think the design is stunning. Um, but I do have to be a bit sort of selfish to ask, you know, just to understand a bit more of the impact, uh, certainly during the construction. But my biggest concern at this time is just um, the property line and the mutual driveway. So I have received a notice from someone at the city to say that. Um, the plans will be taking back part of the driveway and that, that I will need to be paying a fee to the city for a temporary easement on an annual basis. And I just want to know how I can get further assistance and clarity and just, I, I, I think, some support in this process. Um, but also, I'd love to understand, um, you know, the building is now going to be three stories as opposed to something that's much lower beside me. Um, because right beside right right now beside me is a just a two story um, uh, home which is going to be torn down. So you know how does that impact light? What is going to happen during construction? Um, these are the questions that I do you know, would like some help with. I have not been contacted about that, and I would just love to be able to have some safe dialogue about it. And I know that's probably offline, but um, I do have some concerns. And applaud so the design, one, though. I cannot stress that enough. Excellent. Thank you, Warren. Um, it's Mo here. I'm just going to, I'll jump in. Um, I think in terms of uh, what I'd say is, is probably the legal matter, um, we should take that offline. And so um, we'll follow up and find out why you haven't been contacted. Um, uh, it, it is actually with um, our city colleagues who are following up in terms of the easement. Um, so, if you haven't heard, um, we'll uh, make contact uh, on our end and we'll get someone to get in touch. In terms of uh, the I have, kind I of have the... Heard, sorry, Mo, I have heard yep. from them, but it's just, I mean, and I can send you a message directly um, during this just to just to get clarity. It's just it's my concerns about the communication that I received, and oh, I see. as as well as just trying to get dialogue with it and understand what is valid and what isn't. Um, so I'll send you. I can send you a message directly here. Well, sure. um, uh, or actually, it's just Councilor Bradford here. I'll just jump in as oh, well and say, yeah. Warren, thanks for uh, for being here tonight. Uh, appreciate the feedback, and, and staff will respond. But uh, uh, our office is on this, and uh, we're going to work with staff to uh, to resolve this. So we received your email. I've had eyes on it. We're taking action, and and we'll be able to sort this out online. So uh, rest Thank assured. Thank you. And your team has been very, very, very um, just helpful in 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 sort of. You know, helping me get information and just, you know, keeping well, me patient. Which yeah, that's what we're supposed to do. So happy to do it, and um, um, happy happy to work with you. We'll get that uh, that piece resolved on the easement stuff, and uh, and I'll flip it back to staff to to answer your other questions. But thanks for being here on the line tonight, Warren. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Councilor Bradford. Um, in terms of the built form and its impact, um, both uh, you know during construction as we're um, under construction. And the final product, um, maybe if I can get um, one of the architects just to speak to, um, you know, we, we, we have done um, shadow studies, lighting studies, all of that. 
um, as a part of this. Um, so I don't know if uh, Michael or Andrew, if you want to um, just uh, quickly answer some of those questions as well. Sure, uh, <clears throat> Michael, if you want to talk a bit about how we sort of uh, design the setback and lane and and massing and where it's two stories and where it's three. Sure, um, might be best seen in in one of the the 3D or the elevations or the 3D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'll go back to the elevation. Um, sorry, bear with me. Okay. That's slow here. So that th that was actually one of the, the the kind of big driving forces in this in, in the form that you're seeing here is an idea of really kind of sloping up to that corner, making a big gesture at uh, at Chapman and Dawes, but then you know recognizing uh, the height and and scale of the the neighborhood, we wanted to bring that um, uh, western portion of the building back down um, to uh, to just sort of a guard height at the uh, at the roof terrace. And then the hub space that's on level three is set back to the north part of the site to really minimize its impact on the uh, on the street. So when you're walking along the street, it feels a lot more like a two-story building than than a three-story building um, along Chapman. And then it's really along uh, along Dawes that it sort of reveals itself as a as a larger three-story building. Um, so that was something that the the team really worked hard to uh, to to kind of uh, shape in in the project and and then also to the west um, we've thought a lot about the setback from uh, from that property line and um, and how we may kind of you know screen that area or or uh, um, have different kind of uses at the at the grade level to be complementary with the driveway next door as well um, so that it uh, oh sorry I'm getting getting a request to annotate all right hold on yes proved whoever wanted to to draw something on here go ahead sorry that's new it's new to me somebody doing that so i'm, ho I'm hoping it, that it works or it maybe that. um could it have been andrew or Ladia? otherwise we can no. move on. Yeah, it could have been by sure. accident. Someone made the request. Yes, yes, could. Okay, no problem. All right, we will or carry on. It could have been that it could have been that they were asking you to do the drawing for where you were speaking about. I think. Oh, I see. Sorry. Yes, to illustrate the, the different parts. So wh when I'm I'm moving my cursor around on here, I guess is that not is that visible on anyone's screen? It is yeah, visible. we can see it. Right it now. is okay. 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 Fair enough. Um. Okay, so that I uh, hope that helps to answer that uh, part of that idea. And again, you can kind of see to the west here, kind of dipping down to that, uh, you know, to the street frontage there. Um, and I'll just go. Yeah, that, maybe I'll go back to the plans there. Yeah, it, uh, I mean, and maybe I think it that would be better for us. Maybe an, an offline uh, discussion. It doesn't help me, like. I, I mean, I can see what you're doing, and it actually gives me a bit more clarity just on how things might look sort of by the driveway, but it doesn't help me with the actual uh, height right beside me. But I mean, it, I, it's encouraging. Sure, and maybe one, you know, one thought about impact on light and things like that as well. Um, you know, keeping in mind that the way Dawes Road is oriented, almost uh, kind of true north-south, um, you are, you know, you are still getting uh, you know, aside from very early in the morning, which is is still screened by the existing building that's there, as the sun comes around towards you know, let's say, ten eleven in the morning, um, all throughout the day, there's no you know no shadow impact on your, uh, you know, immediately, uh, to, you know, your house immediately to the west. That it wouldn't be impacted at all by this. So that's I think important okay. to important to know. Thank you. So thank you so much, Warren, for those questions. Are there any other questions before we move on to the next ones in the chat? No, I think I'm good for now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Warren. 
So I think we had a question as well about quiet reading areas, if those were available. I hope I can throw this one to Susan Martin, who's our manager of capital projects. Susan, would you come online and share a little bit about the different types of spaces, including some reading spaces that we'll have? Oh, sure. Thanks, Pam. Happy to. Can you hear me? I've been fighting with my audio all night tonight. You sound great. Um, uh, great. Um, we do try to have a variety of spaces uh, available in the library. Um, I'm not sure how much we were able to talk about that front area, that sort of flexible space, which is also the potential for really doubling as a program area as well. So we're not really limited to programming only in the program room. We have that quite large flexible reading lounge in number four. But uh, Michael, if you wouldn't mind going up to the second floor um, as well. Uh, the blue area really lots of comfortable children's area, but really there's there's tables and chairs spread around as well as laptop bars uh, that overlook on the atrium. And then there's a number of actual bookable study rooms as well. So we're again hoping to to be able to provide really a variety of space and think with the zoning in the library and the different heights of the spaces that people are going to be able to find an area or even an area at different parts of the day that might uh, suit what they're looking for, both in terms of comfortable lounge seating as well as, you know, study working space as well as more collaborative spaces. So, as I say, the, the program is really very much in development. So, um, yeah, we'll get there. It's good to know. I mean, really variety is key for us. Um, thanks. Thank you, Susan. That was great. Well, I've got you on the line. We've got questions about bikes. I think there were a couple that came up in the chat around whether or not we'll have bike racks or the ability to rent bikes. Would you be able to answer that one as well? Uh, well, for sure, we're going to be replacing at least what we have, and we know there's a great deal of interest in improving on that. And I think when we're starting to talk to the city about some of the streetscape improvements we're going to be able to achieve along Chapman, we're definitely interested in in, uh, in trying to uh, to increase the ability that that you know folks will have to be able to leave their bikes safely. We're we're all about overlooks for bikes. It's really important to lock up your bike where it's really visible. Um, so we try to do that in uh, in in key locations that will uh, will allow that sort of good safe overlook for bikes. We haven't uh, talked about bike share, but certainly as we're as we're talking with uh, with the city and Green Streets, we're really lucky. We've got a, a really great member of the city um, real estate on our team um, who is a member of the Green Streets group. So they do a lot of work around the city. So we've got a real key um, person that will link us into transportation services, and we can we can talk to them about what the opportunities might be for more related to bikes and bike share. I would also just jump in that you have a counselor who's on the Toronto Parking Authority specifically. Of course, I'm very apologize. interested in bike share. Uh, Ward 19 Beaches East York. We have had uh, significant expansion of bike share uh, across the community, but we got a lot more work to do. We extended the hour, uh, the the time frame in which you can rent it from 30 minutes to 45 minutes. And as we radiate from the out from the core and move bike share across Toronto, that longer trip time is important so folks can get to different journeys. And uh, we, of course, want to see uh, a prominent presence of bike share uh, around the library so people can get there and take advantage of the active transportation and the bike lanes on Dawes and the bike lanes on Danforth uh, and, and uh, St. Clair in the future as well. So more to come and that's uh, that's top of mind for me. Uh, so thanks for the question, Anthony. Yeah, that one's certainly near and dear to your heart, Councillor Bradford, for sure. So yeah, that's great information from both Susan and Councillor Bradford, thank you. I think we've got another question, perhaps for you, Councillor Bradford. Um, it, the question is, why can't the Massey House be used for community center activities and take some of the load off is the, um, the question from the chat. You, you want me to answer that? Um, I, I think, I think that the individual was referring to members of uh, politics, I think, when asking this question. But if anyone on the chat that's from our internal team would like to jump in, including if you'd like to kick things off, we can take it from there. Yeah, well, I, I would say that this is a this is a community that, uh, you know, as we heard in the kind of opening introductions, we're going to continue to experience significant growth. Uh, certainly that uh, that's in the, the plans that are coming forward. 
that is with respect to um, uh, the policies that are in place at a provincial level. Um, but also, you know, we want to be a community that's welcoming and inclusive uh, and accepts that growth and our new neighbors and new Canadians and, and folks who are coming here uh, to this part of East York. So I think that we have to look at all of our assets. Uh, we have to take, uh, take advantage of those spaces. And, and I think part of um, the exercise that, uh, you know, PF and R and others are doing is, is taking stock of those assets uh, and, and, you know, making sure that we're programming them in a way that reflects the changing needs and dynamics of the community. As we're hearing from both the staff and the architects here, the, the hub that we're building as well as the library is going to provide a lot of flexibility. So um, I wouldn't just say that the library is doing all the heavy, heavy lifting. Uh, we got to take advantage of all of those spaces and, and look at opportunities to collaborate with different partners, but definitely this space will be flexible. It will allow us to grow as a community and to use the space in new and adaptive ways, which, which to my mind is a benefit. So I think it's just more, it's more space, it's more options. Uh, and, you know, to my mind, I think that's really exciting. I agree. Thank you so much, Council Bradford, for taking that question. Very much appreciated. I think um, so. We've got some questions around youth services. We certainly will. There's some Craig's included some information in there, but we certainly will be focusing on services for youth, having a youth hub, as well as space across the library and community hub where we can engage with youth in the community. Um, but I do want. I think so, Janet. You've got your hand up. Would you like to share your question over audio? Uh, sure. I just wanted to say that the Children's Peace Theatre in the Massey building that you specifically reference um, is um, uh, managed, it's a city building, but it's under a below market rent lease to the Children's Peace Theatre and they're paying the operating costs of that facility. Um, and they have always been cooperative to share that space and I'm sure they're open to participating in discussions about uh, uses, but they have a lease on that space. I'm not sure for how long, but um, they provide programming to the community there. Great. Yeah, Thank thanks you. for that clarification, uh, Janet, as well. When, when you were saying uh, um, Massey House, I was thinking like, Massey Hall, which just reopened. Uh, and, and so, yes, the Massey Ferguson house there, Children's Peace Theater. Um, and, and Janet's absolutely right that 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 is open and does have programming. Obviously, things have shifted uh, kind of over the past 20 months with what we've been able to do there. And I know that there's actually significant uh, probably investment capital repair work uh, that's probably needed there at, at some point as well. There is a lease, as Janet uh, indicated. But it is an opportunity probably to do more and find ways to collaborate on that site. That's a real gem too, uh, obviously, uh, just immediately adjacent uh, to this site as well. So thanks thanks for that clarification, Janet, and thanks for the question. All right, thank you both so much. Um, all right, so Michael, I think if we can go to the second last slide, I think because we've only got two minutes left, um, I think we'll have to wrap things up, but this has been really tremendous and just all the incredible questions that have come up are just really, really good for us to take back and think through. And we hope that the information that we've been able to share this evening has been helpful to you as well. All right, one more. All right, so I'll just point here to our email address. This is our branch email address. So you can email us to either share any further questions or feedback or to just get on a list where we can uh, keep you updated on events related to the Dawes Road uh, library and community hub project. So we hope you take note of that and get in touch with us. And Eileen, Craig, myself, and the rest of the team at DOGS will be really happy to um, get you connected with us in the, in the long term. So, but other than that, I think just the next slide, Michael. Just a big thank you to everyone for joining today. This has really been an incredible evening that we got to spend with you and to hear from all of our great architects and the whole team. Um, and just all your questions and feedback have been really, really helpful. And we're so thankful that you took this time and hope that you'll stay connected and that we'll see you soon at our next event. So thank you all and have a great night. Thanks folks. Great to see everyone. Thanks staff. See Good you night. soon. Thank Good you night, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Take Thanks, care. Everyone. Well done.
TPL, you always do everything well. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. You're kind words are so nice. So appreciated. So glad that you're here with us tonight. <laughs> I'm trying to get off. Oh, there. <laughs> uh, leave. <laughs> 